Have you ever had things break in production and you're not quite sure what went wrong? I remember the good old days when you had to go use things like tail and grep and then randomly click around the app to try and figure out what broke. <laughs> you don't have to do that anymore, thank heaven. All you have to do is go sign up for Airbrake and then install it in your app. Airbrake is really simple. You get a little code that you put into your config file and then you just install the gem. That's it. Really simple to set up. Then what it does is it aggregates all of the exceptions and errors that are thrown by your application so that you don't have to keep track of that anymore. It collects other information from the system as the errors occur, so parameters and things like that, depending on where the error occurs. And one thing that drove me crazy when we first started getting apps like Airbrake doing this work is that you would get 10,000 of the same error, and that doesn't happen anymore. Now they just aggregate it all together. You can go look at the individual errors and see where and what actually happened, but when it comes right down to it, they just let you know, hey, this error occurred 10,000 times, and then you go look at the individual ones so you can get them fixed. It's really easy to install. I already said that, but I just can't stress that enough. <laughs> you take two seconds, you get it installed, and then you're off to the races. When I'm running a business, that time that it saves me is huge. So go check them out at airbreak.io slash rubyrogues, and that'll let them know that we sent you. But seriously, just make your life easier. If you go check it out at airbreak.io slash rubyrogues, you'll get Airbreak free for 30 days, plus get 50% off the first three months on the startup plan. So go check them out. You can thank me later. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Ruby Rogues. This week on our panel, we have David Richards. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and this week we have a special guest, and that's Aslak Helisoy. Hello, everyone. Do you want to just give a brief introduction to who you are? Um, I think we've had you on the show before, but I think it's been quite a while. A brief introduction. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a software developer. I've been a professional software developer since, I think, 97 or something. Um, got into Agile quite early on, around 2000. I read the XP book and then got involved in the Ruby community around... Well, I got involved actually in the BDD community very early on before anyone knew what it was around 2003. Around the same time, I got into Ruby before there was any Rails, you know, the good old times. And yeah, I created Cucumber in 2008, which is 10 years ago, yesterday. Um, and uh, <laughs> and that's been... Um, that's been my hobby. Uh, that was my hobby for quite a few years. And then 2014, I co-founded a company around Cucumber because uh, it had just grown out of, out of proportion. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so that's what I do now. Um, yeah, maintain the open source project and also do a lot of uh, training uh, and also building a commercial tool mm -hmm. on top of it. Nice. Beautiful. Yeah. So... Um, for any of our listeners that don't know the difference between TDD and BDD, do you want to give us the short version of that? Oh, that's really hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, because, you know, uh, whatever I say, um, Nat Price, is, if he's listening, or anyone else of the old curmudgeons from the XP community, they're just going to come and tell me that, that there is no difference. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so... I think of BDD as a way to do TDD. Um, it, it isn't really different from TDD. You know, it's um, in, in the way that you know you write the test first, and uh, and you use that to in, to to inform uh, how you make decisions about how you write the code. Um, I guess the main the main difference or the main spin on it is that with with BDD there, there's um, there's more emphasis on uh, using using the uh, kind of language that business people, uh, you know, non technical people can understand. Now, this is also something that Kent Beck intended t test driven development to be. You know that it, he does talk about in his original book about the importance of acceptance tests. But I think I think that is something that has kind of gotten lost. Um, mm -hmm. over the time. Most people think of test-driven development as something pretty low-level uh, that, that only programmers do, uh, even though that wasn't the original intention. Uh, so, so BDD tries to sort of like bring this back as, as one of the, you know, as, as the most important uh, thing. So it's, it's grown from being um, 
mm-hmm. uh, something like acceptance test driven development into into being also something that doesn't have anything to do with code at all, which is just various ways that um, business people and um, and programmers can can collaborate better and under, build, you know build a better shared understanding. So it's got this non technical and technical. Um, set of practices around it. Now, I, 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 I kind of want to push on this a little bit because one of the things, at least when I was kind of growing up with TDD, that kept coming up was the fast feedback. And it's really hard to do acceptance testing quickly. Yeah. You know, Selenium takes a while to run. Cypress, I've been playing with Cypress.io lately, um, which is mostly JavaScript focused. It, it'll run other stuff, but... Um, you know, and it's, it's very browser focused, but it, uh, I mean, even that it, it's faster, but yeah. still not, you know, super speedy. And so I think a lot of times when we talk about TDD and we talk about the benefits, we're talking about something that's relatively easy to do and something that runs quickly. And that's why it lends toward the low level stuff. But when, when I really get into it with people, what I find is that we start talking and it's like, okay, but how do you know the whole system works? And yeah. that's where people start to go, oh, okay. I kind of need the acceptance level test, you know, the end-to-end high-level test that says this whole thing does what I expect it to do. And everything yeah. plays nicely together. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I guess that's, that's, um, that's one of the things that makes it really hard to do uh, BDD well. Mm-hmm. I think um, a lot of people who start using uh, well, Cucumber, um, you know, they use it together with some sort of browser testing tool like Selenium or, mm-hmm. or Capybara in, in Ruby, uh, but, but something that exercises the whole stack and it's slow, right? So yep. you lose that really fast feedback loop. Um, and, and when you lose the fast feedback loop, uh, you lose a lot of other things. You, you lose your flow. Um, there's, there's, some, there's some interesting research that has been done by Jacob Nielsen and there's a book that came out a few years ago called Flow by um, a guy whose name is incredibly difficult to pronounce. I'm going to try. Uh, Mihaly. <laughs> yeah, I've got it in front of me here. <laughs> Sik I, I completely butchered his name. Um, but basically what, 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 what the research from these two people uh, – suggest is that you know the human brain has has a few different thresholds uh for you know for for staying focused at the task at hand and and ui ui and ux uh designers they know about this you know that's why you have things like progress bars uh if things take longer than a second Mm -hmm. um you know people know people have known about these things when they when they design user interface um but it, it seems that it's kind of lost on the programming community. You know, we, we somehow accept um, feedback loops that are more than a second or even more than 10 seconds. Some people even have feedback loops that are uh, hours and days and weeks. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I write my code. And I'm not going to know if it works until, well, the testers have tested it at the end of the sprint. <laughs> <laughs> that could be days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you can just forget about getting into this kind of state of, of, of flow where you just lose track of time and space and it's just you and the code in, in, in that kind of environment, right? So, and that's why people have come up with, with things like the test pyramid. You know, you should only have a few uh, full stack tests mm-hmm. and most of your tests should be, should be unit tests. Um, but I've recently, uh, I'm not the only one who's, who started to do this, but I've recently started to, to, to dig a little bit deeper. Why is it that full stack tests are slow? Right? Mm-hmm. What, what, what is it that makes them slow? Um, and, and what makes them slow is, is I.O., you know, n- networking. Yeah. So when you, uh, when you want to run a full stack test, uh, if you're using Selenium, well, the, the first network uh, connection is between your, your Ruby code and your, or your Java code and Selenium, right? Because there mm-hmm. is a web driver because there, there is network protocol going on there. And then there is one, uh, and then there's a whole rendering machinery, which doesn't have IO, but it's pretty computationally intensive. 
Um, and then there is a network hop uh, down to the browser, you know, establishing the HTTP connection. Um, and that is actually relatively slow, especially if you're running hundreds of them, right? So um, the, the reason why full stack tests tend to be slow is that there is so much networking going on between the test and the code being tested. Mm -hmm. um, now, imagine if you could remove all of that networking, um, net, you know, full stack tests don't have to be slow. Um, if you can run everything in the same process and just turn off all of the sockets, then you can run hundreds of, of tests in a second. But very few people do that because that's difficult to do and it isn't, uh, there isn't a ton of, of examples of how to do it. But it's possible. Yeah. I'm afraid, I, I want to back up a little bit. I'm afraid we may have buried the lead a little bit here. Okay. Cucumber is 10. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't know if 10 years are, old. <laughs> I, I'm, and I know that there's a wide community that uses Cucumber, but I'm also aware that there are people that maybe haven't been around as long as I have. I feel like I've been in Ruby forever or that uh, have, just haven't had the exposure. So why don't we back up a little bit and why don't you explain to people what Cucumber is and what you're trying to accomplish with it? And then we can jump back in and talk a little bit more about testing. Yes, let's do that. Um, so, so Cucumber, first and foremost, is, is a tool that supports behavior-driven development, which, which um, you know, like I explained, it's a variant of test-driven development. Mm -hmm. um, and, and why would you do that? Well, um, the, the typical problems that happen on, well, one of, the, one of the most common reasons why software projects go, go wrong is that uh, developers have, a, have an incomplete or a poor understanding of or what it is that the, the stakeholders want or need. You know, people, people tend to uh, be served pretty, pretty vague and inconsistent uh, requirements and, and developers have to fill in a lot of blanks. Um, and then they don't, they don't realize that they've built the wrong thing. Might not have any bugs in it, but they've just built the wrong thing. Uh, they don't realize that until they put it in front of the stakeholders um, who, who tell them that, uh, you know, that's, that's not what I need. Um, it, maybe it's what I asked for, but now that I see it, I realize it, it, it's what I need. So behavior-driven development is, um, is an approach to software development where you put the non-technical stakeholders, uh, product owners, business analysts, uh, domain experts, users, whatever, together with the programmers early on, and, and they, they work together to try and discover all of those ambiguities and uncertainties before you start developing. Uh, rather than finding out after. So it's about shortening that feedback cycle. Mm -hmm. and, one of the w and the way behavior-driven development approaches this, um, this problem is by, um, by having conversations around concrete examples. So, um, so if, if there is a requirement which might be a bit vague, you, know, uh, it, you, you ask somebody uh, in that conversation to come up with an example, a concrete example, uh, which can involve, you know, two people, uh, you know, named Bob and Sally, and um, maybe it's an app about, um, you know, sharing pictures. Um, and they talk about very concrete examples, like, okay, I'm going to share um, a picture. Bob is going to share a picture with, with Sally. Um, and when you have these concrete examples people tend to visualize it in their head a bit more um and they think of of edge cases so like, like okay is there a maximum size for the picture you know mm -hmm. what if it's bigger than um yeah it can't be too big okay what do you mean by too big is it about dimensions is it about number of bytes in a picture so it's a way to explore the requirements and dig into the detail through conversations and examples and then you use cucumber to express those examples um, as um, as executable specifications, uh, which which are essentially they're, well, technically they they are uh, acceptance tests, but they're also written in, in plain English so that anyone non technical can understand them. Um, and so it's a way for everyone on the team, people who have domain knowledge, to design uh, the tests that you're going to use for for the BDD flavor of, of TDD to develop the software. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Kind of. So my experience with Cucumber, and, and this is kind of 
part of what I wanted to dive into anyway. So yeah, so you're talking about specifications and um, you know, you have non-technical or, you know, stakeholders actually writing your specifications and Cucumber makes them executable. Yeah, exactly. Except, um, well, it's not necessarily the, the non-technical stakeholders who are writing those ex- um, specifications. Okay. Um, we, that's what we used to recommend in the beginning. Um, but as, as I've been, you know, working with this now for 10 years and, and teaching a lot of teams, I've seen that that doesn't work so well. So, <laughs> I was going to pick on that. So I'm glad you said that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, well, because what happens when you do that is, uh, is that you don't have the conversation. Right. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of teams trying out behavior during development and you, and you got some, uh, you got the business people writing down given when then and pasting it, pasting it into a Jira ticket. Mm-hmm. And then a developer comes and picks it off and they start working on it. And, but since they never actually had the conversation around it, you know, there's still a lot of room for misinterpretation. Maybe the, the scenario wasn't written in, uh, in a, in a, in a form that lends itself to test driven development. So they have to go and change a lot. So, so it doesn't really work. Um, what works a lot better is to, um, what we've come up with quite recently, a few years ago at Cucumber is a technique called example mapping, which is a much better way for, for the business people to provide their perspective um, on, uh, on, on those executable specifications. But, uh, an example mapping, you can think of it as a way to design your scenarios without getting into the nitty gritty details of given when then. Right. So, um, yeah, so, as, so, the, so the, the conversations around the examples, that, that works really well with this example mapping technique. And then developers can then later, they can go and, and and tr- sort of translate that into given when then and show it to the to the to the product owner or, or business analyst um, so that they can approve it and say yep that still represents what we talked about I understand uh, or or maybe they'll say you know yeah but you know let's make a little change here and let's make a little change there but it's I think it pr- should be primarily the, the the developers who should be writing um, writing the actual gherkin. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we, I've worked at a couple of places where, um, at some level, uh, it was almost mandated, you know, we're going to, we're going to use cucumber. We're going to try and use cucumber, you know, cause somebody went to a conference talk and, um, anyway, it was, it was just interesting because we'd get in there and we'd sit down, you know, you know, kind of with this pipe dream that we were going to work with our, stakeholders to get these specs written yeah. and it just it never quite worked and yeah so the idea that you sit down you have the conversation you hammer hammer it out and then you come back maybe with a given when then to say okay this is this is what we want right and and just kind of have that be the final sign off on something like that that makes a lot more sense yeah, it works a lot better. And it's not fair to ask somebody who's not technical to sit and write down given when then, because you, you do need to have some level of technical understanding in order to, to write it in a format that, <laughs> that, that lends itself to behavior-driven development. Yeah. You know? um, I, I, and also you do want to, I can't stress enough the importance of having the conversations, you know, uh, it's much more important than, uh, you know, than, then or it's much more efficient than writing stuff down and just throwing it over the wall. I, I like that. I, I found that in my experience, the conversation does more than just communicate information, you know, that we, we share understanding, we, we build something up. We, we, we push back sometimes on each other when we, we think something's important and we make sure that we, we really truly understand each other. And then we've also built trust there too. So that conversation really makes more than just whether or not the code is going to get written. It makes uh, a collaboration actually possible. Um, and, and there's a ton I, I'll get. I'll sit in a room and, and I can tell if, if I'm talking about requirements on a, on a system and the person's just kind of 
bullet point listing them off. Oh yeah, this and this and this and this and this. Then I'm going to note, oh yeah, let's push it back a little bit. Let's ask and get a little deeper. You know, so it's not just like, oh yeah, I, I thought for ten minutes and this is it. It's like, no, let's 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 keep <laughs> going. You know, <laughs> so sometimes I can't get that if I get it typed down. I don't quite understand that. Oh, all right, the, the, there's something missing. Or sometimes that I found this a lot, and maybe you guys don't have this experience, but I find a lot that software developers sometimes intimidate other people. You know, that we're we're working in technical fields and we're usually quite competent in what we do, and it's sometimes people. Um, or trying to show off or show up or, or something instead of just being human about it and being good to each other. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes you know, asking somebody to participate um, really should be done with some kindness and some openness and some conversation. At least that's helped me. Yeah. And, and also, you know, when you have a face-to-face conversation, there, there is something that you can do that you cannot do uh, when you're exchanging information with documents. And that is to verify that the other person has understood what you mean, right? Um, yes. I, I use this yeah. trick. <laughs> I use this trick with my with my uh, with my five year old daughter. You know, I ask her something, and and then I ask her, "What did I just tell you to do?" <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> right. Sometimes I'll get a completely different answer than what I expected. And sometimes well, she'll verify and she'll say, you know, you asked me to, you know, to, to pick up my toys, right? But I would be terrified as a product owner if I didn't have that ability to, to, to verify that my developers have understood what, what I asked them to do. Mm-hmm. I, I just don't understand how people can feel comfortable explaining through documents without getting that reassurance. Yeah. Well, yeah. and, the more I pay attention to my writing, the more I realize how bad it is. You know, like yeah. it doesn't communicate meaning at all. Usually, you know, I'll, I, I, Stephen Pinker wrote a book on style and he talked about his way of writing when he writes books is he'll write a sentence, revise it one or two times, he'll revise the whole paragraph one or two times, review the whole chapter or section at least once. And then it goes to the copy editor. I mean, yeah. it just takes that re- repetitive just to see if he can try to make sense. Like, there's no way business, busy, busy business people can do that, you know, to do it well. It's just, that's a hard, hard thing to do. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I remember when, when, we, when Matt and I wrote the Cucumber book, you know, we had a really good uh, editor. Her name's Jackie Carter from... Um, from the pragmatic programmer and she wasn't an expert uh, in cucumber, but you know, ev- I think every paragraph she had us write it like three times because she gave us feedback on it and, and told us like, well, you're not getting your point across, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's invaluable. It's, it's just, so yeah, it's a, it's a lot easier to, <laughs> to talk to someone than to, to write it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting too, because, I mean, in business, it's, it's sometimes it's about the hierarchy or sometimes it's about the software we're trying to push out or sometimes it's about just being practical, you know, but, but really usually software has a deeper meaning too. It's like, oh, you know, I'm trying to get somebody to trust me with their money or yeah. I'm trying to get somebody to switch from this old system to my new great one. And, and so it takes that higher level of really getting into what the users can experience and how can we do that if we're not working well together yeah. uh, as well. It just seems to be a, a non-starter. Yeah. I, I often say that, you know, Cucumber is a testing tool, but it's, it's not a testing tool for your code. It's a testing tool for your understanding. It's right. a way to test everyone's understanding. Yeah. And once you verify that everybody has the same understanding, now you can use that to drive your development. Yeah, yeah, I think I think of it almost like a contract, right? Mm-hmm. But it's a contract that you can execute at the end because everybody so if you specify what you've agreed to in Gherkin, which is the specification language for um for Cucumber, then um then you can verify, you know, because every time you run your Cucumber suite, you verify that you've met the contract, right? And if yeah. you've broken it, then you can scenario doesn't work anymore and it it starts that conversation right okay well is this you know do we need to change the rules do we need to change the contract or do we you know do we need to fix the code yeah and you know 
where, where did the assumptions break down? And, and I find at least in my experience, and I've been a freelancer, I've worked at companies um, and in both situations, sometimes the most important po- uh, thing that something like Cucumber can provide to us is the catalyst for the conversation as opposed to necessarily uh, that it, it passes or checks off the box or whatever. Yeah, and you, you, you mentioned something there about you know, um, requirements uh, and also verifying. Um, you know, on typical software projects, you've got three different kinds of, of, um, of documents or artifacts that you produce in addition to code. You know, you've got the requirements, uh, but you've also got the, um, uh, the, the tests and uh, the acceptance tests, and then you've got the documentation. How do you keep all of these in sync? Right. So, what Cucumber uh, and 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 the Gherkin language aims to do is to is to um, is to you know make this the same document. Uh, a well written Gherkin document is requirements, but it's also tests and it's also documentation. Right. So, so these things never get out of sync. So, uh, it, it's it's not it's not easy to 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 write a document that serves all those purposes. But you know, with practice, uh, you can get there. Yeah. How did you yeah, settle on the given when then? Like, where did that come from? Um, that, that wasn't me. That was, um, well, I was, I was working in ThoughtWorks back in 2003 with Dan North. And he was, he was exploring better ways to, uh, to explain test-driven development to people. So he was playing around with words. So he started, you know, writing his JUnit tests um, you know, mixing them up, you know, saying when when I do this, then this should happen. Mm-hmm. And then he was discussing this with um, with another colleague of ours, Chris Matz, uh, who's a business analyst, uh, who pointed out that, well, when you do this, then this should happen. That really depends on the context. You know, mm-hmm. um, in this context, maybe some in this other context, maybe something else should happen. So that's how they came up with given, um, and. And, and this isn't anything new. You know, you've got arrange, act, assert, which is uh, common from, from uh, you know, it's a common, um, I, I don't know, idiom from, from testing. But it's these three, it's just a different naming for it that fits better with, with natural language uh, given by then. But given, uh, given is how you set up a context, is how you describe what the world looks like today. So that's typically when you will, um, you know, uh, set, set the set the stage, so to speak. It could be creating some objects, um, inserting some rows in the database. When is the main event or the action, um, and then is is the expected outcome that you compare with the actual outcome from the software. Um, so yeah, so it was really um, Dan Dan North and Chris Master came up with it, and then when I was on the Aspect project, we sort of David Chelimsky, who was the lead of of the RSpec project, he added support for that in RSpec. Mm-hmm. And then and that was kind of an afterthought, you know, it didn't really fit with RSpec. So I extracted that into uh, a separate tool and called it Cucumber. So, so that's how it, it was started. But I didn't really invent anything. I just, I just wrote a tool. <laughs> <laughs> when you start a new project, typically you need things like a domain name, hosting, things like that. When I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that, encrypted disks, and VPNs. Plus, they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like backups, node balancer, and long view to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files, and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code RubyRogues2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code again is RubyRogues2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com slash careers to see their available positions. So what are some, you know, I, I, I got to know Cucumber and RSpec through the Ruby on Rails community. Um, but what are some other interesting uses that you've seen Cucumber used for? Um, 
what else what else is it being used in uh, now it's ported to many different languages so you you'll find a, a cucumber implementation in most uh most mainstream languages i know that a lot, it's pretty popular in in finance people use um the support for tables a lot uh, to validate uh various financial calculations and this is something that comes from fitness uh, and fit uh, which mm-hmm. uh, which is um also executable specifications but in a tabular format um i know that some people use it uh for for testing infrastructure um there is i can't remember exactly what it's called now um but they they make they mashed it up with with um uh with provisioning tools you know for building um for building servers and stuff and and to ver- to verify that uh, the server is built correctly uh i know some people are using it for uh security testing um i don't i'm not an expert on security testing so i can't really explain how they do it um but yeah people people are just mashing it up with with lots of different things i like that i think we had uh, chuck didn't we have some people talking about how they were using it for security and, and deployment maybe uh six months ago um i i love i love seeing that because to me a system gets too big for me to understand it very quickly yeah and i'm always pushing for something to be consistent and complete you know, I need it consistent and complete, and that I can't do without something like a BDD tool. I've got to have something like like this in yeah. place. Is I'm not smart enough. I <laughs> I can't build anything significant with my mere limitations of my intelligence. I've got to find a way to to actually build something good um, with something like cucumbers. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I ended up writing unit tests last night. Uh, just thinking about that, I. Uh, we there's a, a an implementation of cucumber for Elixir. Uh, it's called White Bread, and uh, <laughs> it uses Gherkin in the back. And, uh-huh. it, um, and and I was thinking last night, you know, I I need that. <laughs> this very <laughs> yeah. complicated edge case, and the setup was crazy. And I I wrote it as a unit test, and um, I bet it was 50 lines long just to get the one unit test. Like you know what, this isn't understandable. Yeah. <laughs> I need a way to convey what was I trying to do and, and what was the situation? And uh, I somehow natu- natural language, being able to explain it correctly, this is what's going on and then be able to verify, yep, and this is how I, I do each step. And now I've, I've got uh, something, if the abstraction's the right feel, um, at least that's been my experience, that abstraction's always about the right feel of, okay, yeah, I can, I can stay in and, and think about the, uh, it at that level. Yeah, it can definitely, uh, even though it, it, you know, it's first and foremost, you know, designed to be used um, as a collaborative tool. It can definitely also be used just in solo, just to help you take a step back and, and shape your thoughts um, and approach um, approach the problem from a, from a bit higher level. Because poor me made a mess of <laughs> mess of my work last night. <laughs> Unfortunately, I could do. <laughs> Yep. Nice. Um, so I was I was curious. Um, so when you when you train people uh, and you're getting involved, you turn this into a company. It sounds like for about four years now. Uh, is it mostly uh, technical training, or are you, do you find that you're doing a lot more organizational therapy, <laughs> getting people <laughs> to work, work well together, or what kinds of um, things you find yourself doing? It's about half and half. Um, every every organization is is different. Um, but we work a lot with organizations that have a real problem, um, with, with requirements, you know, they have a lot of, uh, um, their developers have a lot of rework, uh, and they realize that the, the reason for this is that, uh, the business people aren't able to communicate what they need, uh, in an appropriate way, uh, to the developers, you know, they're using scrum, but, but that doesn't really provide them with, um, w- with enough structure uh, to do this. So, so a lot of the people that we train, um, are, are non-technical people. We, we have, we have a day where we put, um, everybody in the same room and we teach them techniques like example mapping. Uh, and, and, and we teach them about examples. Um, you know, what, what is an example? What, what is a concrete example? Um, 
and, and they learn, you know, better ways to collaborate. Um, and then we show them how they can take their, their huge, hairy user stories and break them down into something um, that, that is actually understood and small enough to be done, um, you know, in a week's time. And then also we, we work with, uh, with people who are uh, with teams that have, um, you know, software that I don't know how to test. Um, and, and that's a lot more technical. Um, you know, that, that's, that's all about teaching them refactoring techniques to, to introduce seams where they can, where they can, um, where they can connect their tests, um, stuff like, um, ports and adapters, uh, to decouple, um, um, you know, to, to decouple their, um, their connection to, to external systems so they can more easily test it and so on. So this, yeah, it's a mix of, of organizational therapy and, uh, and, and very, very technical stuff. I love it. It's, it's fascinating uh, how, you know, ingrained software development can really kind of be a heartbeat of an organization. And even if that's not their primary business, that the way we develop IT projects and any software projects that we have, it really does bring us together. Uh, and, and gives us a rhythm we can work together sometimes <laughs> if it's working <laughs> yeah. or we could have a coronary event and, and, and it doesn't work at all <laughs> and we break apart <laughs> yeah at least that's there, the way i see it <laughs> so less ceremonies i find in in software development you know the, the i mean agile has obviously had a big impact on how how teams teams work you know it's, it's made an improvement at, but at the same time it, it's introduced a lot of of cargo cult you know people just do <laughs> things you know putting the the weird coconuts on their ears and you know jumping around <laughs> they're not really getting the effects that they were hoping for you know <laughs> yeah go uh, figure <laughs> so, so we, yeah so, so we te- so we teach them some more cargo cult but but um uh, yeah i don't know it, it's it's hard people really need to figure out for themselves how they can be more efficient um, and that's also part of what we try and, and teach people. You know, we can't give you all the answers. Um, but what we can tell you is that what you need to do is to talk more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like that. I, I, there, there's, there's an, if the, the most, most of the organizations that we see are the, are the organizations that are struggling and, and it's just, you know, some of the silos that I come across, they're just, you know, you wouldn't believe it. Like people, you know, people are completely compartment. How do you say it? Compartmentalized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and some places they're not even um, even they don't even know who they, who they should talk to. You know, um, so it's really hard to to build software in that kind of environment. Yeah, yeah. And I've got an example. I'm trying to see if I can tell it in a way <laughs> without <laughs> without making the guilty feel identified. <laughs> <laughs> I did a project once for a very large organization and they were having a rough time. And um, our, our team, uh, we came out of the Ruby community and we, we knew how to do agile. We knew how to communicate and we, we delivered something at a quarter of the time at a third, the price and we had four times the results. And that hit the uh, CTO's desk at the very, you know, this is tens of thousands of people in this organization. And he asked us to train his whole organization how to build software. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I found the, the same experience of like, oh my goodness, you know, these people um, um, aren't exposed to communication. They're not exposed to uh, workflows that are um, humane or kind enough that they can actually integrate with people and, and work out problems safely. And, um, you know, it was very... Um, adversarial a lot of things are very adversarial and so learning to communicate and slow down and be kind and listen uh <laughs> turns out it was more of a therapy it was more about psychology maybe than it was about software but but we kind of build these weird silos because budgeting because layoffs because corporate politics whatever the reasons and and yeah. uh it just seems like it's a really hard place to hard way to get things done yeah yeah, it's, it's young. We're in a young industry, and we, you know, we still haven't quite figured out how to do this efficiently at scale. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yeah. So, what's changed in Cucumber over the last ten years? 
one of the things that, um, well, one of the things, the two things. So the Cucumber itself as a tool has changed, but also the way in which uh, we use it has changed. Um, or at least the way I like to use it and the way I, I tell people that they should use it. So I used to use, I'll talk about a little bit about how, how the usage has changed or mm-hmm. recommended usage. And I'll say a little bit about how, how the tool itself has changed. So um, in the early days, uh, you know, 2008 till 2013, roughly, you know, I used Cucumber primarily to drive um, some sort of web browser because I was building web apps. Web apps it could be Capybara right. or, or some, you know, some headless or head headful. Um, <laughs> headful, browser. I like it. <laughs> browser. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then I started realizing that you know this is this is slow. Um, it's not giving me the kind of feedback cycle. It's not giving me the sign, the kind of design pressure that I get from more traditional TDD, where um, mm-hmm. you know where, where the tests are informing my design. So a few years ago, I um, I guess it clicked for me really when uh, Constantine uh, Constantine Kudryashov, who's the author of Behat, which is Cucumber for for PHP, mm-hmm. uh, he came up with this concept uh, called ex, um, specific. Uh, hang on. Um, <laughs> modeling by example so what he did when he used when he when he used uses bdd and and the cucumber or the hat <clears throat> is to to write scenarios um without any implementation detail in them um and we we, we kind of knew about this already you know we we've, we've been advocating for a long time that you don't put buttons and uh, and text fields and, and stuff like that inside your scenarios mm-hmm. but we would still <clears throat> start automating um the ui but he he would go further down he would he would write the scenarios uh, you know just using business language um without any ui details in there um and then he would use that to test drive the domain layer that's where he would start so he would like kind of start in the middle um and and he would he would you know iterate on that until it, until he had a domain model that that did what um, his scenario said that it should do. So that would give him really, really fast feedback because every, all of this stuff runs in the same process, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and once that was stable, now he would start writing the UI. And he would use the same scenarios, just different step definitions. Um, or, or even the same step definitions, but you know, delegating to some, uh, something that uses Capybara uh, um, or, or, bra- or selenium mm-hmm. rather than uh talking straight to the domain layer um so he's, so he's separating um the the part of it where you dis, where you're discovering what your what your api is like from uh, how you impl- implement a ui on top of it um, and that turns out to be a much more efficient um, way to do bdd um and the nice thing about it is that now you can use the same scenarios, well, many, many nice things. You can use the same scenarios to test just your domain logic. So you're trading, you're trading confidence for speed. You know, these, these scenarios, they run incredibly fast. Um, but you don't get the same confidence uh, as you do through the UI. Um, but you can run them again, full stack, and that, that'll be slower. Um, but you get more confidence. But the other benefit you get from that is that your mm-hmm. your scenarios, because they don't talk about uh, user interface, they they talk about the the domain logic and the business rules. You're much more likely to to involve the business stakeholders when they don't don't have to you know wade through ten furlongs of uh, of UI interaction scripts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so it kind of <clears throat> reinforces the collaboration aspect of BDD. So, so that's changed how I how I pro, how how I use Cucumber, and that's what I tell people that should, they should always start with: write it without UI and start by fleshing out your domain layer. Um, now, on the technical side, what's changing Cucumber itself? Um, not that much. Um, I guess the main big difference, uh, and that's actually happened in the past one or two years, is the introduction of something called Cucumber Expressions. So if, you, if you've ever used Cucumber, uh, you know that you have to use regular expressions to implement your step definitions. Um, 
step definitions. They, they map the natural language to interaction with your system. Uh, and regular expressions um, are really powerful, but they are also, you know, you know, not, not that nice to read. Mm-hmm. So cucumber expressions is, uh, is an alternative to regular expressions that is much more readable, and it also has um, better support for creating your own custom types. Uh, so that was added to, uh, to Cucumber Ruby uh, one or two, I think one year ago, um, and we're slowly ro- rolling that out to the other implementations. Then there's tag expressions. Um, you know, you can put tags on scenarios um, as a as a way of grouping them, and then you can use um, well, you can you can filter on, on certain tags. So we've improved the way that you can filter uh, filter scenarios, um, introducing. Uh, a little query language which is called tag expressions and they're, they're essentially just boolean expressions uh, where you can say you know i want to run the fast tests uh, but not the ones that um, are marked with um, um, i don't know i can't come up with a good example but you can create a boolean expressions with tags to, to right. do what do you want to run um and i guess that, that those are the main differences um now we we have some some things that we planned. We were planning to make the first change to the Gherkin language in in um, I think in in eight years. I think the last major change that we added was the introduction of scenario outlines, uh, which is a way to create a template for a for a scenario and and run it with many different uh, values. Um, but we haven't changed it in eight years. But since we've started. Uh, you know, using and promoting this te- technique called example mapping, there is now there's a bit of, a, of an impedance mismatch between what, um, what uh, an example map looks like and what a cucumber scenario looks like. First of all, when you do example mapping, you don't talk about scenarios, you talk about examples. So we are, uh, we're adding a synonym to scenario. You can call them example instead because... Um, you know, in, in, in other practices of, of BDD, people tend to talk about them as, as examples, and it's just a bit confusing to have examples mm-hmm. and scenarios. Right. Uh, and the other thing is, um, is rules. So that's a way to, to group examples. This example mapping technique, um, it basically encourages people to, to think about the, the, the various business rules or the acceptance criteria they have, um, and then come up with examples to illustrate each rule. Um, that's what you do in example mapping. So, so we're adding this as a, we're basically adding another keyword that will let you group related examples within a feature. Um, but, th- but that's, that's currently, uh, you know, it's hasn't landed yet. Gotcha. Um, and then, um, I guess the main, an- another thing we're, we're thinking about is to, um, because there are so many implementations of Cucumber now, and there's a lot of work to maintain everything and keep it in sync. Um, some people, uh, one guy, uh, the, uh, Charlie Rudolph, who's working on the JavaScript version, he's written a, uh, an implementation in Go. Um, and, and we're going we're gonna to explore if we, can, um, if we can base all of the other implementations on top of that, because it... it, it um, it basically takes some of the impl- some some of the stuff that we just have to repeat in every implementation and puts it in one binary, uh, and that's 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 more that's more valuable for the development team uh, because you know there's there's a million people using this tool and we're only about a, de- a dozen developers, uh, none of which are paid to work on it. So we just need to to simplify uh, or reduce the amount of code we have to maintain. So I guess yeah, not that exciting for for the users, but pretty exciting for us. <laughs> so what's your ultimate goal then with cucumber is it to simplify testing and make that collaboration easier or is there some other outcome that you're looking to achieve um i guess my ultimate goal with um with cucumber and bdd for uh, you know for the users is um is to shorten the feedback loop um, and, and make it easier for, for, for teams to build the right software and, and make it easier to maintain um, for years. 
um, that that's that's really the main main goal, you know, may, and, and making more enjoyable, um, you know, so people can feel confident that that whatever software they're working on, they can keep working on it, um, and n- really knowing how it works. Um, and 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 personally, you know, um, it's to be able to make a living uh, off of that somehow uh, <laughs> for as long as, <laughs> for as, long as, as, long yeah. as I can. Uh, yeah. Well, one of the things just about that, you know, uh, the long term, you know, have the system work. I mean, I, I, I can tell you a project I've jumped into where they've had good testing, good BDD, where they've actually done this. I could just sit back and spend, you know, an evening and read, okay, this is what was intended. This is where they came from. This is how they approach these problems. And, um, and that is got to be the, the fastest way I've ever gotten involved in, in projects when they've done that well. And, and that's almost always <laughs> the reason people would leave a project sometimes is it's just gotten to be such a mess. It's, it's a terror to, to work on it. And so I don't want to be playing for all the mistakes I'm making. So having yeah. that clean so they can have a long-term life cycle mm-hmm. instead of just a quick greenfield project. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an investment, you know, any, any kind of successful product is going to live for, a, you know, at least, you know, five years, say, and, you know, most software developers, they don't stick around on, on the same project for more than, I don't know, three years, right? So, so, so there's a time where, where none of the original developers are going to be around in any, any successful project. So it, you really want to make an investment uh, into, into making it maintainable. And, um, yeah, that, that's, that's part of the main goal of, of BDD and Cucumber, to make it maintainable. So you have to be careful to also make sure that your that cucumber, you know, your your own scenarios are maintainable, and that means, you know, treating treating your test automation code uh, with the same love and care as you as you have for the production code. You know, you need to refactor that stuff as well, and you need to keep it clean and understandable. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get those benefits. It's just going to be in the way. I love that. That's that's power. You know, and and the cost of development. I mean, we just do it because everybody does it, but that's an expensive investment. You know, so from a business perspective, you know, we've got to have something we can hold on to for a, a little while. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, you, you got this cost of change curve that, it, you know, that I, I often show that in, in my trainings. You know, the, the cost of change increases with time for, for lots of different reasons. Uh, and at some point, you know, the cost of a change is higher than the value of a change. Uh-huh. That's when that's when people start uh, screaming rewrite, you know, but but that's not valuable for for the business. So so trying to keep that cost of change low over time, um, and cucumber, you know, using BDD and cucumber is just one of the things that you can do to, to try and keep that in check. <laughs> yep. you know, I I, uh, I reached out while we've been recording today. I reached out to an old friend um, years and years ago. We did a project together. And he thought I was a lot smarter than I was because in our first week working together, I, I introduced him to Cucumber. <laughs> 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 he hadn't heard of it and he loved it. You know, he was really big about, he was a product owner and he's really big about all these things that Cucumber's about. And so I think I got, a, I don't know, 40, 40 IQ points in his mind. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I reached out to him. Is there anything you want to ask? And I hadn't heard back, but uh, I know that he's a, he's a big fan. And, and I love that because, you know, his, his job was, you know, as a product owner, you know, he had a lot of problems he couldn't solve. Mm. And uh, until we started working together differently, um, it just wasn't doable. And in fact, kind of, uh, if I can brag about him a little bit, you know, he'd had a lot of success, but uh, this one project uh, actually drove the merger of his company with another larger company. They loved his product so much that they, <laughs> they bought this big company just for his little little side project because it had changed. It's it a medical product, and um, it was pretty pretty amazing. So I, anyway, um, but it but it was kind of stuck until we started to learn to communicate and get all the people working together for the same purpose. So. Uh, it was one one more success in cucumbers in cucumber side. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, you know, I 
I, I was thinking when you were telling that little story that one of, one of the things that I love about the, the cucumber community and, and, you know, whether it's people who, who are contributing or just u- loving to use it is that it, it is, a, a, is a mindset that appeals to people uh, who, who like to communicate with, with other people um, who, who care, right? Um, that, I mean... I'm fully aware that, that that cucumber isn't for isn't for everyone, and I think the, the people who don't like it are people who like to work solo, and and there's nothing wrong with 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 those people. I just want to you know some people um, some people just like to work solo, um, but but people who people who who like to engage with other people, um, you know that's the kind of I don't know that's the kind of people that I like to work with. Um, so yeah, I mean. It's. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I like to work with 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 people in in software who like to interact with other people. I think that's one of the things that makes this community so great. Yeah, I like that. Well, it, it, and knowing that that's that's important. You know, you make good software that way. It's it's a personal preference. You like that, mm-hmm. but then you can also show results, which I think speak for themselves too, which is nice. Yeah. So I can have a preference, but I can also do better collectively together when we when we see it together <laughs> it's great charles are you thinking about another question yeah i was actually wondering um so you have like the unit test the fast uh low cost test at the bottom and then you've got a handful of acceptance level tests that are expensive at the top how do you gauge how much of that acceptance level testing you need yeah <laughs> That's a really difficult one. It depends on so many different factors. It depends on the complexity of your domain, of your of your technology, uh, how you interact with with your stakeholders. I like to approach. I, I find that um, again, I'm coming back to example mapping, but I find that example mapping really helps me come up with an appropriate amount of, of scenarios to describe the, the essential business rules from from enough angles without mm-hmm. having to create too many of them. So if you, if you, it's simple, you know, you, you take a rule, let's say, let's say it's a game. This is a word guessing game, right? Um, where I, I think of a word and you, and you try and guess my word. So there's, there's a bunch of rules around that, that we can try and, and, and talk about and discover. So let's say we discover a rule that, um, you know, Maximum five characters. Okay, so now we can try and come up with examples that illustrate that. You know, what should happen if there's uh, zero characters? What should happen if there's five? What should happen if there's six? Um, and then we, 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 can, we can have examples to illustrate that. And then you come up with, and you try to that into given when then. And then I have another technique, which I learned from Liz Keogh, who's been in the BDD community for a long time, and that is to to ask um, how can I how can I change the given so that I get a different then mm-hmm. so given this when I do that then this should happen okay can I change the given so that something else should happen so that that's a great way to explore and try and come up with a, a few more examples to, to explore explore your, your rules a bit more and I find that you know, this is this strikes a good balance between covering all the interesting cases without coming up with too many of them. Um, and and if you manage to to verify all of these rules without having to go through the UI, you know, if you can do it using modeling by example, you know, connect them mm-hmm. straight to the main layer, even even disconnecting the database. You know, you can run these really, really fast and get lots and lots of confidence. Um, I know that in Rails, it's kind of hard to decouple your domain logic from from your database. Um, so, so Rails isn't. Um, it, yeah, it's particularly hard to do this in Rails, but it, it you know it's easier easier in other in other frameworks. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's what I that's what I use as a main heuristic um, to, to find out if I have enough. And then I can choose, I can pick a handful of those scenarios to go through the full stack. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you, th- if you think of the pyramid as just for the sake of simplicity, let's say it has three levels. You know, it's got te- unit tests at the bottom, it's got full stack tests at the top, and then it's got some sort of component testy something in between in the middle. Uh, my cucumber scenarios, they tend to r- be runnable at both of the top level, at both the middle level and the top level of the pyramid. Uh, the difference is that I run fewer of them at the top, and at the top, I run them through the UI, uh, and at the middle, I, I run all of them. Um, and um, yeah, if you want to, if you want to know more about how how this works in practice, you can you can find some of the some of my talks are online uh, about um, testable architecture, um, where where I have some some drawings and some um, some some more detailed explanations of, of that technique. <laughs> One thing I love about this last question, and this is to me the one thing I love about Cucumber, is that asking these kinds of questions, even though it's not an easy question to answer, it forces me to think about the architecture of my system. Is it testable? How do I break it down? At what point am I clear and confident? Or, or, or do I, at what point do I have a clear and thorough understanding of my system? You know, and, and actually engages me differently which that's the value right there. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of other value we get by the result of, of the tests, but, but engaging in the question in that way, um, it's, it's a lot easier. I, I, I participated on a project once where uh, um, it was, I think, three or four front-end developers were given a hard task. And so, okay, we're going to build this system. And so they built these great screens, and beautiful things, and they barely got it connected to the database right before his delivery. It's like, okay, we're done. <laughs> and, and, and like, wait, and, 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 you know, they weren't 10% done. And because they, they didn't have that thorough architectural understanding of what's actually going on, where does the value get created for the user? And so these are hard questions to answer, but they force us to see the system, the, 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 the whole end of parts and how do they work together? So I, that's, that right there. I mean, if if you're doing more of that kind of thinking, <laughs> your system's already ten times better than it would have been. I think that's been my experience. Yeah, I think I think le- learning to decouple uh, the various parts of your application is is something that I think most developers uh, can get better at. You know, decoupling your domain logic from your persistence logic, decoupling your your UI from your domain logic. Uh, decoupling your REST interface from, you know, both the UI and the domain logic. Um, it's you, you have to you have to know how to do that if you want to be able to 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 um, to do test driven development and also get and also have fast tests. You know, if if you don't know how to do that, then then you can't. So, <laughs> uh, and and the the best um, the best um, there's two patterns that 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 I use over and over again to achieve this. One of them is, is, uh, is the ports and adapters uh, pattern, also called hexagonal architecture, which uh, is by um, Alistair Coburn. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, um, I guess it's more, pr- probably more familiar to, uh, or falls, comes more natural for people who work in, in, um, in languages like Java and, uh, and .NET because they have interfaces. Uh, so they're more used to, to that sort of decoupling. Um, and, and the other one is something called contract contract testing. Um, so let, let, let's say that I have, um, um, I don't know, I've got, I've got something that depends on, on a payment gateway, right? So you know, I have a shopping app, shopping web app, so you can buy something. So I need to test that various things happen when, uh, a payment is accepted or rejected, right? Now, the 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 brute force naive way to test that is to just test that with <laughs> with a card. Maybe you'll have some sort of test gateway that Stripe or somebody provides, right? But but you can also uh, put an abstraction in front of Stripe, which is your port, and then you can um, during testing you can you can you can use a simulator uh, to make. Uh, to make those tests really fast, because you're not you're not doing an API call at all. You're just calling into this little simulator. 
and then you use contract testing to verify that your simulator is uh, is functionally equivalent to the real thing. So co the combination of contract testing and ports and adapters is really powerful for decoupling your system and making it testable. I love that. We've had to do that with our system. We I, mean, I work in a fintech company and that's yeah. literally had that problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it is really it's 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 really amazing when you uh, when you manage to to pull that decoupling off. You know, your typical application like that. You know, and probably you probably have like dozens of uh, of external web services and whatnot that you're calling, right? Um, but you know, for the majority of your tests, you can you can you can completely stub them out um, and just control them from your tests. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. And and the fact that I mean I like that you, you lead with that. There's two patterns: the contract testing and the parts and, and adapters, uh, or ports, ports and adapters. Um, because when you're doing this, you're thinking in terms of principles and patterns. And then, oh yeah, well, I can compare that to a different pattern or a different principle. And then I, I can work and reasonably say, yeah, this is a good system because because I can see the field. You know, I can see things I didn't build or choices that I could have you know gone down because it's. You've elevated the conversation to a very useful place. Uh, so that's another. I love it. <laughs> okay, I'm having a fanboy moment. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Let's go ahead and do picks then, real quick. Hey, when it comes to health, you probably have some of the same disqualifications that I do. You sit all day. You run a busy life. And when you do make it to the gym, the only thing you're really qualified to do is turn the treadmill on. I was an athlete in high school, and so I could have thrown swimming in the mix, but that was about it. And I didn't really know what to do when I decided that I needed to get my health under control, especially since I have type 2 diabetes and I want to be around for my kids. So I contacted my friend JC over at DevLifts, and DevLifts, they did me a huge, huge, huge favor. Sure, it's a paid service, but what they did is they gave me a workout program. They also gave me some eating guidelines and they have a slack room where I can go and I can ask questions and they give weekly challenges on things that I need to do differently. I really, really love it. So if you're looking for a way to get into shape, you're looking for a way to improve your health, then go check them out at devlifts.io. That's D E V L I F T S dot I O. Yeah. Do you have some things that you want to just shout out about real quick? Ah, uh, something I want to shout out about. Ooh. Um, well, when is this going on? When is this going live? Uh, a couple of weeks. In Two a couple weeks. of weeks. Okay, so Q uh, Q Fest uh, is going to be in the past. So that's our conference. Um, we have um, well, we have a. Uh, a uh, I'm coming to Chicago uh, in in June to do um, a, a two day BDD uh, and cucumber training. So if you're in Chicago or nearby or want to go to Chicago, the windy city. Um, Hope to see you there. Um, if you're interested in how to run really, really fast full stack acceptance tests, um, take a look at Cucumber Electron. Now, I know this is the uh, Ruby Rogues podcast. So that mm -hmm. is for JavaScript, but I'm sure <laughs> there are some Polyglot developers out there. Um, and come and join us. Um, on Slack, we have a Slack channel. If you if you want if you want to ask the core team of Cucumber uh, questions about Cucumber or BDD, um, we're a very friendly um, little community where uh, you know we we try to help everyone uh, as best as we can. And if you want training for your own company, uh, you'll find um, lots of uh, information about our training at cucumber.io/training. Very good. Very cool. Uh, we'll have to get you on JavaScript Jabber as well. I didn't realize that Cucumber had been ported over to JavaScript. It's been ported to every language. Nice. <laughs> There's an OCaml version now. Is it really? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to try that. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> I was looking for it for Stan. Stan is this weird probabilistic programming. Maybe I'll have oh. to write the, the port for that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, Charles, David, it's been a pleasure uh, being on the podcast. Thanks so much for, for having me. Thank you very Thanks much. For coming. Have, have a great day. Say hi to your girls. <laughs> yeah, I'll do. All Take right. Care.
Uh, David, do you have some picks for us? I do. I've got one today. I, I like keeping it simple. Uh, this has been a great conversation. And what I, um, it reminded me of a book that I keep re-quoting over and over, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, a bunch of quotes from Richard Feynman. Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. And if you want to uh, have a beautiful mind that simplified things that can deliver well and, uh, and, and you know, it's a great thing to read. Um, and it fits well, I, I feel, with this, this conversation today. Awesome. Very cool. I'm trying to think of things to pick, <laughs> honestly. Um, it's, it's been Sorry, kind of, we just did it. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm just going to pick a few things related to my talk at uh, Ruby Hack in Salt Lake. So one of the things that's been helpful for me is the course on Udemy for Ethereum and uh, cryptocurrency blockchain development. So I'm speaking about Ruby and blockchain um, and I'm still kind of torn. I, I, keep, I keep going back and forth and, you know, maybe people have feelings and, you know, you can give me feedback once, of course, by the time that happens. Yeah. <laughs> by the time you hear this, my talk should be written because it's like the week of the conference, but I'm kind of torn between showing how a blockchain works and how to implement one in Ruby and then building on that or just building on top of Ethereum and using Ruby to do some of the work and, uh, things like that. So, Yeah. Um, we'll see where I wind up, but, uh, anyway, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of playing with that and that has been really, really tremendous. There's also a series of YouTube videos on how to build a blockchain with JavaScript. And a lot of that I found very applicable. And so I'll put links to both of those in the show notes. Um, but yeah, I'm playing around with that. Um, I've had a few people actually ask me for a blockchain related podcast. I don't know if there's enough demand for it. I guess if you're interested, you can bother me about it, but, uh, yeah, um, we're going to check that out and uh, see how all that goes. But anyway, that th that's kind of what I've been looking at lately. Sounds exciting. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and sign off. Uh, thank you, Dave, for coming. And yeah, Aslak had to run and pick up uh, his kids, but uh, we appreciate him too. So uh, we will wrap this up and we'll catch everybody next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.